Welcome to Double Barrel Non-Duality. Today's guest is, drumroll please, Suzanne Chang. She's here to visit, say hi, and play with us today. Hi. You can hear me okay? Yep. Cool. Do I stay muted too? Uh, uh, you don't necessarily have to, as long as you don't have background noise. Yeah. Okay. I think you're good. Yeah. If there's like, you know, sounds in the background and stuff, sometimes it gets a little choppy, but otherwise you should be fine. Um, so let's see who wants to put their hands up and we can get rolling. How are you, by the way, Suzanne? Oh, really good. Happy to be here. <laughs> good. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate uh -huh. it. No, thanks for the invite. Okay, let's get started with Marcy. Hello. Hello. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. It's Marcy. Marcy. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I have my question today has to do with devotion. Um, devotion. Uh, to truth or or you know putting placing consciousness or awareness in the heart um area or dropping it down and into kind of the heart area seems to help me stay out of my mind um and more in presence and and less just generally kind of freaked out by the kind of stuff that's coming through these days, which has been a little difficult. Mm. So, yeah, if you could speak to that. Suzanne, do you have anything specific on that? You go first. Okay, I will. <laughs> um. I think there were times for me when that type of practice or perhaps moving attention into, into the body more than in the head or into the chest or heart space, um, seemed to happen. It seemed to happen more spontaneously. I think, uh, intuition led that, led that to happening, I suppose, um, I think it's it's helpful and valuable to also look behind the scenes a bit and just see, well, what are my agendas with this? Am I trying to not feel something? Am I trying to avoid anything? Um, it may not be the case at all. It may just be a very natural place for your attention to flow in the moment. But always being a bit alert for any any sort of background agendas or identity processes to, to start running in these situations can be helpful because you mentioned external life circumstances as well. Um, and while again, it can be very natural for attention to move into the, to the heart space, the chest, the gut, various parts of the body or anywhere, uh, that can happen at the same time as this sort of partially conscious background identity structure sort of floating around and it can just be helpful to realize that's there if it is um if it is there's nothing specific to do about it just the the knowing of it is helpful often uh and sometimes it just kind of relaxes the whole thing also just in asking that question i could be wrong but i sense just a bit of almost like a bit of doubt about it um or why 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 even question doing that uh and that often is a sort of signature that there may be some background material that's just not quite accepting something. And it may be something very simple in the moment. And it may be something, you know, deeper and more uh, like an ongoing process in you or your life. So those are the things that came when, uh, when you asked the question. Yeah. So, so the, you don't speak about it much. I mean, you don't use that in your book, uh, you know, and, and so that was one reason I wanted to 
ask you about it. And the my life is it's more like the material that's coming up now, um, just spontaneously can be um you know, it's just difficult stuff coming and kind of throw me into a mental state of agitation. And so this is what I'm, when I'm speaking of the devotion, it's like, okay, I'm devoted to the truth. I'll keep going through this, you know, um, but, but the devotion helps me, you know, kind of stay with it. If that. Yeah. Yeah. Makes Absolutely. Sense. Yeah. It makes sense. Okay. And a lot of that difficult material comes up in this process. It just does. And it will until it sort of, subsides and never i probably never really fully absolutely subsides there's probably a bit of unconscious material that'll surface here and there ongoing even when there's no sense of separation or no sense of self remaining but it it, it just feels different and it, it uh, moves through more effortlessly i would say and it's more direct um but yeah you know having some sense of um or, or reminding yourself of why why you're doing this, that there is there is a sort of method to the madness, perhaps um, that this is not for this isn't suffering just for its own sake. Uh, it's suffering to to see something more clearly, perhaps whatever that might be, and that to me does feel devotional, but it's hard for me to pick the devotional aspect out of anything, I guess. Like there is a definitely a devotional aspect to all of this. There's a there's a profound love for these con these conversations, and also a profound um, regard for this this very mysterious process. Um, uh, but it's also hard to pull that out of the the sort of empty nature of all of it as well. Um, so I, I think you're you you feel to me like you're attuned very well, uh, and you're you're treating this with uh, with the respect it deserves and feeling into the various spaces, whether it's the heady space or the heart space. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it feels to me like you're in a good place, but yeah, you can move through some very difficult material going through this. It just happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of it lately is like this utter helplessness. You yeah. Know? yeah no. That's yeah, really hard. <laughs> that's a, that's really good news though. <laughs> It's music to my ears, but it's very difficult to go through no matter how you look at it from the perspective of a of a person, of yeah. an individual, of a character. Why would you want to be helpless? You you don't, you know, and even even in the practical sense of being a mammal in this world, helplessness is not what what that individual wants or needs. But when it comes to this sort of bizarre process where we we in a sense regress beyond the formation of an of an identity uh you will go through that and, and just experience this utter helplessness uh i i like to say a few things about it but it doesn't really matter it's something you just have to go through but one is just just notice nature just notice the way nature moves it's utterly helpless um but there's a there's a there's a profound strength in helplessness uh there's a strength in a sense to the wholeness of it but all the if you break it up into individual aspects and look at it from that standpoint, it's going to feel helpless in a lonely way, in a sense, or in a unfair way, or something. But we look at the whole the whole of it; it makes sense. You know, things have to die to to change forms and and regrow and be uh, reformed and so forth. And there's some beauty and genius to that that symphony. But uh, to the to the individual or to the apparent individual, it's not comfortable. No, no, no. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's okay, but it's really, you know, it's really distressing to who I have taken myself to be, you know. Um, so, but I, I understand it's mm -hmm. part of the process. Yeah. So that's the devotion to truth kind of helps with. Yeah. Okay. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I will say, you know, I, I, not that I want to give you some kind of hope in the mind or anything, but things do look different on the other side of this as well, um, in a way that's very difficult to talk about, really impossible to talk about. 
but it turns out things are just fine. Things are just completely okay, really. Um, but in a quite ineffable way, it's not, it's not something I can give you a reason for. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I know this place that you're, that you're going, you're experiencing and it is okay, but there's nothing you can do to make it feel okay. And you, you seem like you have the maturity to, to not try to apply coping mechanism and agendas and distractions. You're, you're facing it full on and that's how this goes. So I can't think of any other way to orient you than what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Suzanne may have some comments or not. Yeah. I'll add something. Um, yeah, that was a really beautiful question. And yeah, I've definitely felt a lot of helplessness during this. And in a way, it really is a good sign because the, the belief that the mind has control and knows what will happen does give you a false sense of security. And it's really comforting. So then without that, you do feel really helpless and the mind will go crazy to tell you, don't go here. You know, this is dangerous, but it's really not. And it's kind of testing you to see that you can go through any discomfort. You really, really can, but the mind will really challenge you in any possible way. And sometimes in the most convincing way specifically for you, you know, it will say the most, uh, the most convincing thing, I guess the thing that, that scares you the most, you know, which I think you mentioned, like your identity is being uh, threatened, you know, who you thought you were. Or so that I have any control over, you know, I can, I can make things different. I can choose to make things different. I don't believe that at all. <laughs> There's not. That's not, it's just not true. So, you know, it, it's, it's distressing to the system and I just, you know, I feel it. Um, of course. Yeah. Do you feel it right now in the yeah. body? Yeah. 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 Where do you sense it? It's kind of, uh, I'm getting a full, <laughs> full body. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Like full on from head to toe. Um, shake, shaky kind of sh shaky it's like trembly inner trembling yeah beautiful just let it tremble yeah I'm here with you yeah, and just okay. notice what the mind is saying let it say whatever it wants and just let the body tremble You know, the mind doesn't even have much to say at this point. It's just a, like a, uh, oh, there, you know, I was just outside and this mother, this little dove was sitting on her nest and we were having to do some work on the tree <laughs> and going around the little dove. And it was just, you know, like trying to sit on her little babies and here we are around it. And that's kind of how I feel like this mother trying to sit on her little babies and I can't do anything because mm. <laughs> there's nothing oh. to do. <laughs> yeah. To sit here and be scared, you know? Yeah, it feels so raw and tender. It's like, it's really unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. But these these really are the shields coming coming off, you know? You're feeling the absolute rawness of everything. Uh, yeah. And it's intense. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is intense. So it's just, it's just a f what we feel as we let go of, or, or as there's a letting go or. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. Cause there were these imaginary walls that we put up, you know, and it was, it was maintained energetically and then belief in the mind was there. But now as that softens, you're just feeling the raw boundless energy of it the pure energy of it without knowing what that is it, it's quite a different you know it, it's quite um challenging for the nervous system sometimes because you're not used to it yeah 
yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, though. That's it's uh, you know, it's uh, comforting to have a vo voices, your voices that um, that I've been through this, and and I hear you, and I trust you, know, you and Angelo. I I really you know, my teachers that there is. Um, something beautiful on the other side. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and you're already there. This is already <laughs> it, you know? Yeah. Right, it's, it's like so yeah. paradoxical, but. Yeah. I hear you. Thank you. I'll, I'll let somebody else go. Yeah. Thank thanks you. so much. Thank you. Bye. Oops. Okay. Sorry about that. Back to the top. We have uh, Mike. Hey, Angela. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Okay. Is it okay to read a poem? Sure. So, um, as long I as it's of, not song of myself, which is like, no, you know, it's, a poem, it's, a poem, long. it's a poem that I wrote and it's only five hours long. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I kind of struggled with, um, I've been struggling a lot lately um, since the retreat in January and um, kind of wanted, I don't know, I don't write poems, so this might really suck just to let you know, <laughs> but it kind of, I think it talks about where I'm at. Um, so I'm going to start. I call the poem, The Old Suit. I wake up in a daze most mornings as I lie there and my persona forms from unconscious knots. Tied tight with choices I cannot unravel by sheer force of will. I'm so tired. An old, the, an old threadbare suit projects my selfness, selfness, but it no longer fits. The seams strain and tear. The garment of my past, my only attire, held together by life's chosen threads. Will it be the only suit I ever wear? In an instant, Gordian knots magically loosen. The suit unravels, exposing raw skin. Cool air brushes feelings of suitless timelessness in the void. Senses overwhelmed by fleeting beauty, but just for a moment. Aware of my nakedness, the voices arise. Forged by 10,000 knots, they assert their sway. Should and shouldn't, are and aren't. Shame and guilt fuse the fragments with, ma with dark magic. With the sigh, my persona returns seemingly stronger, yet anxious and different than before. Yet I remember that touch of cool air, weightless liberation. I slumber, dreaming of soaring through the skies, sun warm soul gliding over shattered plains, descending into darkness only to awaken in the days. Mm. That's kind of how I feel. <laughs> wow, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, back in January during the retreat, I had, I don't know if you call it an awakening, but the void just appeared. Mm. And um, it was fucking great for about three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, really, really old trauma um, and grief and shame filled that space. It's still there. You know, my meditations are, have never been the same um, since then. Um, it's almost like at times meditating is no different than not meditating. Um, I reached out to you and you suggested that I work with Michael, Michael Z, and that's been great. Um, this is just really hard stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, weird things like you know taking a walk in the woods and there's like a little hole like maybe that big in the ground and being afraid i'm gonna fall in mm -hmm. what's that <laughs> yeah um i i don't really know like nothing seems right anymore yeah um so i mean just any comments that you have on that i'd really appreciate sure you know the it, it's still um it still amazes me uh how uh, powerful the illusion of mind identification actually is, mm -hmm. meaning how much it can numb us to as far as what we are actually experiencing, but somehow hiding from ourselves, intense emotions, physical pain, even 
um, it's a it's a sort of stable, disassociated state that that's actually quite brittle and fragile, and requires a ton of energy put into it all the time. But when you have billions of people putting that energy in to keep that illusion operating, some pretty strange results come, including violence and things like that. But one of the weird weirdest ones is that <clears throat> you think you feel emotions before before that shift occurs, right? But mm -hmm. once that shift occurs and you get that that amazing ex ex experience of you know expansiveness or flow or nothing pushing against anything and it's such such a beautiful knowing and it's it's obviously more real than what what the mind is saying and has been saying um and then you're equally surprised when the other shoe drops mm -hmm. and that space is suddenly filled with um and this is all lawful this is just how it goes uh, but it's all suddenly filled with what you've been repressing somehow through mind identification. And one of the common ones I see that does surprise people is that is fear, actually. The, the you know, I, I can remember examples in myself. One was like driving, like driving next to a semi truck and feeling this abject fear that like I could that truck could slide into me. I could slide into that truck. It was like snowing, you know, and I was like, wow, I can't believe how intense this fear is. And I've, do, I've done this a million times. I've driven down the road and dangerous conditions. And somehow the mind can just ignore the the reality of the moment somehow, you know, but now you can't ignore that. You can't ignore anything, um, which is great. That's, that's what realization is about. Not, not ignoring as Suzanne said to the previous questioner at the end, but don't forget, <laughs> or it doesn't matter if you forget or not, but you're, you're already here. It's already here. This is already it. There's nowhere to get. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and it's very true. But again, somehow that gets obscured. Like what this, this gets obscured. The emptiness of it, the clarity of it, the intimacy of it, the absolute no meaning or purposeness of it, uh, the the inability to hide anything in it. Somehow that all gets obscured with this world of being in the mind, being in thought somehow or identified with thought. Uh, but yeah, when you, when you first take a big step uh, out of that world or you, you, take that that world takes a big hit and it just can't operate the way it used to it's very surprising how we process emotion it's very surprising how direct things feel uh, it takes a lot of adjustment and underneath all of it the what's not let's say stopped operating yet that, that can hide in the background for a while with that honeymoon period is really just this very simple thing that's not a thing but i'm going to call it an identity structure i'm going to call it the tendency to just say no, the tendency to feel like I can control, I can look at experience, say, I don't like it. And then, and then convince myself I can do something about it at all. That, that simple movement happens very quickly in the mind and that's still there. And so what, what happens is you get this big expansive experience, this blowout often blow out of, of the sense of identity and just that, that crystal clarity and flow. And then all of that repressed material and unconscious stuff and shadow comes comes in. And even that's okay. That's just part of this. But what makes it feel not okay is that 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 little bit of resistance hiding in the background, that that will, that that illusion of personhood, of se of separation, that all of a sudden comes back online big time. And it wraps itself around all of your experience. And it's like, no, 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 no. Pushing, pulling, struggling, feeling not okay. And it can just have this some total experience of dysphoria. Mm -hmm. of like, what the hell did I do to my, like, why I didn't sign up for this. Right. I wanted enlightenment. I wanted <laughs> spiritual, you know, experiences and all of it. Right. Um, and, and yeah, it can be daunting and it can be surprising. I remember it very clearly. Uh, so you're in good company in the sense that people who walk this path or, you know, have this, this occur, this unbinding occur, they go through this. Um, it's just, it's just part of the process. It, there's n just nothing you can, there's no way around it. Uh, there's, there's nothing I can do to make you really feel better other than just to say, you're being shown what needs to be seen. So the more willingness you have to see clearly moment to moment, the easier it will be. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to suddenly, you can't snap your fingers and make it easy, really. Uh, but what you can do is say, okay, I don't have to manage the past. I don't have to manage even how I was feeling yesterday. I don't have to manage how I was feeling this morning. And I don't have to worry worry about the future. I already know that because who the hell knows what's going to happen next year, much less, you know, five years from now. So 
really all I'm left with is this, whatever's occurring here, you know? Mm -hmm. And if I don't reference the past, I don't really reference a thought about how was I feeling, what's been going on since this shift occurred and all that, which is just the mind stuff. What do I, what it's really going on right now, you know? And you're kind of left with this, this raw experience. Um, what are my perceptions in this experience? You know, there may be some mental perceptions about um, what to do about it or whether it's gone wrong or I just don't feel good. Okay, well, those are thoughts, you know, those are sort of made out of that thought stuff, that consciousness, whatever. And there's a feeling, you know, the body has a sensation, a feeling, feeling tone. When I put my attention there, you know, is there a problem? Not per se, there's there's a sensation, there's a, or a cluster of sensations, right? What if I just rest there? What if all I have to do is rest there? There's nothing else to do here. What if that's it, you know? That's the beauty and simplicity of this message that this is it, is really you're not called upon to do anything at all. Um, there's simply the textures of appearance right now, and that's all. And that's all there ever was, really. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a double-edged sword when you're dropped out of that world of the mind identified space of trying to control and take a position and feel how, pay attention to how you're feeling in regards to this and that. And then you drop out of that into this place where there's no reference point. Uh, then the double-edged sword is if you try to use that again, you try to use that framework again, which we do for a while, it's so uncomfortable. Right. That's good because the, ultimately you'll stop trying to use it. Instead, we just drop right into this and realize this is it. This is simply what's what, you know, uh, the sensations, the sounds, completely empty. No substance there, no agenda, no movement here or there, no inside, no outside, just a sort of empty clarity. And, and even with that empty clarity, there's no holding, meaning attention may spontaneously move into a formation of emotion or a formation of sensation in the body. Uh, and that's also empty clarity, and it's also intimate and immediate. It has both of those so seemingly paradoxical qualities, but in this world, this non-world, there's no paradox. So all you're really called to do is look closely, feel closely, listen closely. Um, and that's what you're, that's what you're going to do ongoing. <laughs> this, this process is teaching you to do that. The moment you get up in your mind to start touching it, thought, touching it with thought and perception and belief and time, especially Oh, this was like this. And then this happened. And then that happened. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's really uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not so uncomfortable when it's just one breath, mm -hmm. one sensation of your hand on the carpet or the dog or the, you know, feeling the air move across the skin, just attend to what is provided. There's a, a term in Zen called Oryoki, which means just enough. This is just enough. It's just enough. It's perfect. Can you feel into that? Yeah. Good. Actually, do I do some work um, when I'm out running, just in my with my visual sense? Yeah, and just take just take it all in as opposed to focusing. Yeah, and that seems to pull me into that space. Yep, beautiful. Just, like I feel like I'm it, everything just shrinks. I don't know how to describe it, but yeah, it's not describable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, and and you know, pay attention to those those times and spaces in life that work for you like that. Some people, it's being in nature, you know, it just opens everything and it clarifies everything. So give yourself the gift of, you know, in the practical sense, occupying the spaces or situations that work mm -hmm. to, to just open things up for you. Yeah. Thank you. And you're welcome. I don't know, Suzanne may have something to say. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll just quickly add, that was a beautiful poem. Oh, thank everything you. that was said was really beautiful. Um, one thing that comes to mind is when I had moments where the mind was just like crazy and I didn't know what to do and I felt lost. Um, I guess this kind of speaks to the other question as well. Mm -hmm. I, I would genuinely, it would come from a really genuine place. Like just take me or just show me what I need to see. Okay. Like, what am I holding on to? Because if the mind is kind of going crazy about something, you're, you're wanting a specific outcome. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's kind of like trying to, trying to um, figure out the situation in all of these different ways. And so it's just going kind of crazy. And in a way, there is no answer in the mind, not that you can't use it sometimes, but yeah, when it's just chaotic, then, you know, sometimes there would be this like genuine want for just like surrender, peace, you know? I do know, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. it's hard to not surrender. <laughs> Well, yeah, you don't do it, but you know, yeah. when it, when it comes to that point where it's just like too much, mm -hmm. which is a common thing here, it, it, it has to be that way. It has to be messy. This isn't like, um, the person doesn't enjoy right. the boundlessness. It's just boundlessness, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Uh, okay, Kelly is next. Hello. Hang on, Hi. let me change my view for a second so I can see you. Hi. Hello. Um, so I just recently found out about you um, and I, I sent you a message like last week because I'm having some kind of confusion on, on where I am in, in the process. And I saw your interview with uh, Chris uh, and I reached out and kind of uh, spoke with her, um, just telling her the different uh, experiences I've had. And I related because we had had very powerful things with Vipassana. Um, and I guess, I don't know how much you have to know, but... Um, uh, at the end of it, I said, I don't know where I am in this process. And she said, okay, like, well, you're on the other side. Uh, and I felt like, is that possible? Because that Vipassana experience was like almost 12 years ago. Uh, and it was very powerful. And uh, I had, my mind was still and um, uh, everything was glowing with uh, light. And that lasted for like two months. Um, and, and then several things came back in. So it was always like, uh, I feel that I lost it. Um, and I, I also was involved in the TM community for uh, several years, like four years after this initial experience. And the what they teach is that that first shift means that there's always a witnessing 24 hours a day, even during sleep. And that's not my experience. And I know that. So I feel that I'm stumbling. Um, and she just mentioned that maybe I should reach out and, and ask you the question. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> so what you described to me feels very much like an awakening or like Ken Cho of Satori mm -hmm. based on the way you described it. I mean, is it, did, did the, what was in, what was um, the insight that was clarified in that? Has it gone anywhere? Yeah. Has it really, I mean, is it, is it essentially there already without having to think about it? I mean, I feel that vast spaciousness, but, uh, mm -hmm. I have a huge trauma history and, um, and all of that is, is coming out always, mm -hmm. but yes, that I can feel that, but, yeah. um, That's yeah. I just, okay. <laughs> Nothing, but no, no reason to make it complicated now. Um, and this comes from a lot of experience of interacting with a lot of people about things like this. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but I do want to say a couple of things about it. Um, first of all, the, the witnessing thing, you'll probably almost never ever hear me teaching about witnesses or witnessing or anything like that, because I think it's just confusing to people and it's dualistic. What is, how is a witness apart from something they're witnessing? That's a dualistic mental construct to me. So I don't yeah. talk that way at all. So don't, I, I would, I would suggest you do whatever you want, but I would suggest just don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> but, Cause if you use that as a litmus test or anything as a litmus test, it just, it leads to doubt. Oh, wait a minute. So-and-so said it should be like this, but this is my experience. And don't worry, your experience is always right. The experience that's here right now is always right because it's the only one. 
period. <laughs> yeah. Can't be wrong. It's not right or wrong. It's just what is, right? So that's it. So that that part's done for you in a sense, right? Um, you know, if, to put this in a Zen context, in Zen, that would be stream entry, essentially, or in Buddhism, it'd be stream entry. That's that's the 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 spiritual birth uh in earnest. Like that's when the real the real unbinding starts. With before that, it's very conceptual. You know, you you can feel like you're interested in spirituality and all this stuff, but it's all very, very heady. And the identity structure is very much intact. After that shift, it's it's there's still identity functioning for a while, but uh, but it's like you know, meing and being, and sometimes it's prominent and sometimes it's not. But but essentially there's there's a there's a knowingness that's a a sort of a Zochen term. It's a really cool one, knowingness without an object of knowing, right? There's something in your experience all the time that doesn't need thoughts to be to know itself. It's just simple, simple clarity, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's very obvious. This is clear to you. So what do you do now? That's the question, right? What to do or what not to do? You know what? So I, I just tell people w- do what works for you. Some people can listen to a sort of Neo Advaita message and, and just stop altogether or realize you can't stop. Realize there's that that seeker, that seeking energy that's remaining, that it really just can't do anything. It's, it's essentially just a collection of thoughts anyway. And what's happening is just what's happening. And hearing that enough, you know, the, that identity can just kind of somehow terminate itself or the snake that eats its own tail for other people, you know, uh, doing some work or doing some inquiry can be very helpful. Uh, but the inquiry is not into the nature of reality or anything because you probably don't really have that fundamental question anymore because you're living it. Yeah. It's just, it's just what's obscuring it in various ways. That's the challenge, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, Yeah, I mean, but I do feel a sense of a flow. I guess I have a lot of stuff coming out. This mm-hmm. all feels okay. Mm-hmm. Um, in my own experience, and when I wrote you the message, I was confused because I felt like I haven't had this first shift, but I feel really drawn to the um, sense fields. Mm-hmm. That is what I feel. That is where I want to go. <laughs> Good. Perfect. Okay. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, and there are very, very simple and very direct ways to work in the sense fields. Um, um, and none of them are practices, essentially they're investigations. They're really just seeing what's there or not there. That's it. (laughs) Right. So like when you look and what do you see in front of you? Like, do you see, do you see objects in front of you? It, it, I feel like it wavers, it goes in and out, you know, because mm-hmm. there can be a lot of light coming through sometimes, or there can be a sense of. Well, just look at what's right in front of your face right now. Yeah. Yeah. Now, is there, is there an object there? Is there a thing out there somewhere? Is there an out there? Just answer from your instinct. It still feels like there's an out there. It mm-hmm. does feel that way. And what do you, what, what makes it feel that way? What are you referencing to make, to, to, to pick that up, to say it's out there? Is it what you're actually seeing right now? Or is it, is it some attention bouncing back into your mind to say that's out there? <laughs> and now I don't know. Right. Good. I like that. <laughs> that's, I want you to stay in the, I don't know. And just, but, but keep looking, don't, don't analyze anything. This okay. is not, this is not the mind's territory. If thoughts are here, it's just not going to be helpful. It's not going to hurt anything, but it's not going to be helpful. Okay. That's the kind of investigation. Yeah. And it will feel like that. It almost feels like ecstatic at some point. And it's very direct and it, it's very fast. Actually. It's the yeah. only thing that stops that from just completely unbinding everything and the identity just dissolving completely is the tendency to go back and try to be someone, try to be someone in reference to something try to have my story again, have my life again, have my time frame again, but you don't need any of that. It's not, it's just not necessary here. What the, the sense fields are gold mines. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. (laughs) You're so welcome. Trust yourself, trust yourself and do what feels totally natural to you. And, and just let that spontaneity move through everything. Thank you. Sure. (laughs) Suzanne, I don't know if you have anything to say. Yeah, that was beautiful. You seem quite intuitive too. So yeah, I would say go with your gut instinct and don't mentally try to understand what's going on because it's not really that necessary. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, you know, I'm inclined to say one other thing, and that is, um, this is just from my own intuition, and it may be valuable or not at all. You can let it go if, if it's not valuable or doesn't resonate. But I think I'm inclined to tell you, like, that we can have this idea about spirituality as a whole, like a thing called spirituality, which includes like all kinds of preconceived ideas about spiritual people and teachers and stuff and processes and all this. And it feels really good to let that go. And you will let it go sooner or later. And maybe you've already let it go, or maybe you haven't, but you can give yourself permission to let, even let that go because that can be that sort of thing we keep checking back with ourselves on or about. Uh, it's almost like another identity, right? A spiritual identity or a, the spiritual world. Um, but it, it becomes so, you, uh, you have to be so authentic here that there, you realize that there's just nothing out there like that. You know, um, there may be teachings and pointings that are helpful, but ultimately the truth is right in front of your face. And it's not a thought and it's not a concept and it's, it's not, um, you know, it's just what's right there. Yeah. And I think you, you seem to have the intuition as Suzanne said, you seem to have that intuitive nature, uh, and, and that, that sort of porous nature. And that's hugely valuable in deeper stages of realization because you can really let this process overtake. Um, but just trust yourself. I, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's extremely relevant and helpful. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have uh, Kwang. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, so I experience a lot of fear um, because I feel like I'm obsessed with searching for a truth and I just want to know so badly what this reality is all about, but um, in the very um, ontological way. And so I search for various teachings, I compare them, and I feel like I'm addicted to that. And it's kind of destroying my life because I don't want to do anything else besides that. I just feel like this is the most important thing to, to know. What is it, basically? What is this reality? Um, and I think it's fear-based. Um, some time ago, I had this very um, traumatizing psychedelic experience. And ever since the then, I'm kind of obsessed with it. Um, and yeah, I also meditate a lot. I do the shadow work. I do the self-inquiry. But also, there is this addiction to spiritual message, basically. And it's out of fear, and I don't know how to deal with that. Okay, thank you for your question. Suzanne, do you want to start? Or... You don't have to. Um, let me see. Yeah, so I think there's so much information out there about what reality actually is. But you're never far from it. It's already this. It's just the pure sensations in your body and it's not your body. I kind of want to ask you what happened in the psychedelic experience and what was so fearful about it. Um, basically, I was left alone in the void. Um, and I think that fear of loneliness is the main factor of that. Um, yeah. And it kind of shattered my world view about uh, spirituality and the uh, reality basically because before that i thought that reality is you know um 
unconditional love and, and God and stuff. And when I hear sometimes your message about no self, I also shiver and get <laughs> in panic mode because it feels um, so terrifying. And yeah. I just cannot let it go. I just constantly search for new information and I constantly <laughs> listen to this message. Mm. What do you feel in your body right now? There are just sensations right now. Mm -hmm. um, and when I just get into this moment and I'm aware of those sensations and the mind, which has its own story, I can see that there is no problem at all but yeah <laughs> yeah um i would say um listen to things lightly this it's kind of beautiful that you, there is this urgency there like this longing that's there But I think I would say to focus on really being in the body and to kind of um, nourish the body, like be there for the body, be there for that sense of loneliness and that fear. So I think what you saw in the psychedelic experience it'll be colored by the emotion that's the strongest. So if, if there was a lot of loneliness and fear, which is really understandable, um, you know, there might be this interpretation that reality is something like that. Uh, but what it's actually doing is kind of confronting this, the illusory separate reality and so when that is confronted, it will produce this foundational fear of my existence. And in a way, that's a big part of the collapse of that illusion. And I would say this is a lot about slowly strengthening the nervous system and being aware of how much you can handle in this moment. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of strengthening your body. By just being here. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, mind will never know, right? It's And it feels utterly hopeless, like, to know the truth about what is it. I can just be this, and I cannot say a word about it. And it's, it's hopeless for the mind. Yeah, so this is, this can't be mentally understood. Words can't touch it at all because it already simply is. Um, yeah, I kind of also want to ask if there was something, uh, you know, traumatizing that happened in childhood that would be reminiscent of that fear and loneliness. Yes, yes, many times. Um, it's all the stories um, with my parents, but I, I think I, for the most part, I've been through this on my psychotherapy, I guess, but maybe not, not to that extent, <laughs> not enough yet. So, yeah, it's definitely related to my childhood. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So this isn't about getting rid of anything. It's it's really about actually becoming more and more okay with exactly what's here. So if that intense fear is here, um, you know, those stories and those narratives will most likely come up. And I th- I think it's good to address that kind of stuff and not just focus completely on the truth because everything is a truth. There is no separation in that way. It's life already. So I kind of want to soften your um, belief that getting to a certain truth or realization is the only answer. Yeah, definitely there's a part of me that um, just is and there's a mind that just, yeah, but what about this and this? What happens after that? Death, (laughs) what's all about? Um, And all the stories going on. It just wants to know so badly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's understandable. No one knows what happens after death. Yeah. And that's why this is so addictive. Because Mm -hmm. when you search um, for spiritual info, um, there are many teachers who claim that they know (laughs) everything, every answer. They know how reality, reality is. And for a moment, it feels good that someone knows, but then you recognize that those are just beliefs and nobody knows anything and it's hopeless. Mm. Have you, have you done body work before? Uh, Like being really attentive to the body and sensations? Yes. Yes, that's my practice too. Yeah, yeah. I I would I would say um don't don't take the more radical message too seriously. I know maybe that's not possible. Um but I think if it's if it's It's bringing the body to overwhelm often. Um, I, I would say take a break from it here and there and focus more on just the pure sensations in the body and really being with that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like right now, do you feel like you can just simply allow the body to be exactly how it is? Mm, Yes. Mm, There is some tension around the chest mostly. But when I really dive into it, it's, it's just, those are just sensations. And it's not bad, not good. It just is flowing. Mm. Nice. Yep. Yeah. It's like all those struggle is like a shadow. When I look into it, it's gone, basically. Mm hmm. Yeah. You mean all the mental struggle? Yeah, when, and, and suffering in general. When I look into it, yeah, it's it's it's, it's immediately gone. Under inspection, it's gone. Mm. Mm-hmm. 
but but it sneaks back in when I'm not aware. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very sneaky. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. Yeah. Thank you. I'll pass it on to you, Angelo. Okie dokie. Thanks, Kwong. And thank you, Suzanne. So I, I have very little to add. Um, she said pretty much what I would, much of what I would have said, um, meaning what I sensed in the initial description was like a little bit of a skew to the masculine or to the disintegrative. And I don't know what the psychedelic was, but like, it sounds like it could have been 5-MeO and that's an ex extreme blowout into the disintegrative aspect, which is very... Um, can give a lot of insight, but it can be very destabilizing as well. Uh, and her pointers to, to really just let yourself kind of move back into that natural balance of more into the body, into sensation, into acceptance of what's actually here, what's actually occurring um, in your immediate experience, rather than trying to seek a truth or seek, because in a sense that that's another sort of disintegrative movement, the movement of conceptuality, conceptualization, seeking mental truth or understandings or descriptions and all that. Um, it's really, it's, it's like in a way that's a re probably a response to that, that complete disruption you experienced uh, in your identity. But the response is kind of more of what you don't need in a way. Like you don't, I don't think it's, you don't need more disintegration or more, of into that masculine energy field. It's more like come back to the feminine aspect, which you definitely have. Um, and you, your intuition has already led you there to doing this kind of somatic work and stuff. Um, but maybe just a little bit of an adjustment there. Um, and sometimes looking into what, what is it that makes me want to understand things in a, in a conceptual way, spirituality and so forth, uh, you know, why do I need to describe this to myself? Why do I need to describe it to others? Have I gotten, have I had rewards in life for, for having knowledge, right? Because in the relative world, we, we actually do get rewarded for knowledge, for being smart, for being the one that knows. Uh, and, and that has, that's, that has its place in the world, but in the, in the absolute sense or in the, in the intimate sense, why, what is there to describe, you know, um, hmm. And, and it can be. I, I think. I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's out of fear. I, yeah. It's basically out of fear and fear of just unknown that I can't really know what is it all about. Like, yeah. Um, what happened during psychedelic? I just realized that nobody knows anything, and it's so freaking scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that kind of knowing. Um, That kind of that kind of knowing of is is a sort of describing to yourself, right? Uh, it's it's a it's trying to it's trying to find an island in this vast ocean, right? And so, what I think sometimes these really intense experiences, the the blowout experience with psychedelics, by Vimeo and things like that, and even sometimes people have who have awakenings with no context at all, which does happen, even sometimes in like childhood. It sets up a, a similar process I see where it's like part of you tells yourself you really want this, you really because you you felt it, you feel it directly, this completely ineffable knowing that everything's perfectly okay, but also there's kind of nothing here, you know. Um, there's something so mysterious and and there's freeing about that. At the same time, another part of us is terrified of it. And those they're kind of competing agendas and they can get confused, right? So the mm. the part of us that says, Oh, I'm trying to learn more about this is actually not really trying to learn more about it so it can wake up more. It's trying to stay asleep. It's trying to grab something and hold on for dear life, actually. It's trying to hold on to a knowledge base about what happened to me instead of letting what is obviously never not happening just just go deeper and deeper and deeper until it's just free fall, right? So sometimes just looking into those competing agendas at a psychological level can be helpful just to see clearly what your motivations are. And when you sort of see them all, oh, wow, over here, I have this belief and, and that's kind of in contradiction to this belief and this experience. Sometimes just seeing those clearly enough, enough times, it's like the the darkness is dispelled enough or the 
the hiddenness of it is dispelled enough that you, you're like, okay, there's nothing more to address there. And then you can kind of relax. And when you relax, then that, or the disintegration and integration are not too hits that beautiful balance. And it's like, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything is deeply and profoundly okay. And it's also completely formless <laughs> and without boundary and all, all that. So, um, I think you're, I think you're generally in a good place, maybe just a little bit skewed toward the masculine or something like that in those ways. Um, and I agree with Suzanne that, you know, somatic pra practices or finding ways to just really, um, physically attend to your, your sense fields and specifically the body sense, um, and, and acceptance practices. And if that intellectual pull just stays really strong, just keep looking into it. Okay. Well, why do I want to know? What I what do I really think I'm going to get out of it? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm actually trying to anchor myself somewhere, but that's not possible. I can't do that. I already know that. The insight is already clear clear on that. Okay. All right. And then it might calm down and it might come back. And if it comes back, look again, look closely. What am I really trying to do here? You know, what are my agendas? What are the what are the background beliefs in this this mental space that seems to have a pull to it? And again, for me, I think just seeing clearly enough times that these beliefs are here and there and the competing agendas, they tend to just soften up and often just dissolve. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for your question. Thanks. Okay. Uh, let's see here. We are down to Alec. Hi, Angelo. Hey. Hi, man. Um, hey. I'm really grateful to be here and talk with the two of you. Uh, oddly, I have a lot of resonance with a lot of things people have said here. And um, Kwong's, yeah, just talking about a, a psychedelic experience that was kind of traumatic. I've had a similar, um, I've had something similar happen of, uh, I actually, prior to finding your work, I used to call that psychedelic experience an awakening. And I don't know that it actually was, but, uh, now that I've learned more, but, um, I definitely, yeah, I, you know, it started out great. It was a great experience at first and, you know, all the stereotypical psychedelic, uh, tropes of, uh, just feeling really like, like I kind of like I died and existence was still there. Existence was existing and everything made sense. Everything was clear and euphoric and all of that. But in that same experience, kind of like at the snap of the fingers, it switched and, uh, per, you know, the other shoe dropped in a sense and it went to complete dysphoria and like brokenness, nothing made sense. And I was so confused and similar to what, um, Kwong was just saying of like, I felt so alone and like so much fear of being alone and like that nobody else that I've ever interacted with my parents, like they didn't even exist. And yeah, my mind or my ego, perhaps like, I feel like took that for a big ego trip for a while. And I like spent a couple of years living in a sort of solipsistic nightmare where I didn't know where anything was, anything was real. If anybody I interacted with was anybody else, it was, it was strange. Um, and I do think that that's colored my experience since. And uh, it's not where my question lies though right now. I feel like I've dissolved a lot of that um, solipsistic stuff, but that sense of a me, of my ego is very much still here, I feel, and like that I'm ad identified with it. And um, yeah, I, um, I guess to get to where I want to talk about is, uh, I've heard you talk about uh, with in an in a interview with Violet that you a favorite movie of yours is Revolver. Um, and um, hopefully this isn't a spoiler. If it is, it's a small one. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the scene where Jake runs out of, or walks out of the doctor's office and he's narrating and he gets hit by the car, uh, yeah. but he doesn't really get hit by the car and he's narrating and he's like, we're just, you know, like, look at the little, look at the boy with the trophy or like, look at the, 
Yeah. Like the, get a nice pat on the back or, and, you know, whether you fear me or revere me, please think I'm special. Um, and that we're just approval junkies and, um, like monkeys in suits looking for approval. Mm. That's where I feel like I've come to a really strong realization around like my existence. Like since I was young, I have spent so much of my life looking for approval and I have so much fear of, yeah, the, the, here's a, here's a connection to the pre previous question i think somewhat of a theme here is fear that's what i'm looking at is i feel like i have so much fear around not um getting people's approval um like i'm like the, i've been the quintessential people pleaser throughout my life and i heard you in an inter interview with someone recently that really opened my eyes you said something about people pleasing being like a form of manipulation and and tr trying to have some sense of control um, so that people like you. And I'd never quite put that together, but I was like, oh my God, yeah, that's what it is. It's, and, and that scene from Revolver also, it hit me like that, that car hit Jake of like, I was like, oh my God, yeah, right here, that's me. Um, and um, so yeah, let me put this into some context of, like where I'm at in my life. I've, I'm in a partnership. I've been in a partnership for the last seven years and um, I've been really struggle and I really struggle with intimacy it, with, with my partner in like what feels like whenever there's things that are, whenever I feel like there's conflict, I'm so afraid of conflict. I'm so afraid of, of, arguing of getting yeah having somebody be upset with me and particularly people who are who I'm close with um and yeah I've I've always kind of had this persona of somebody who's easy to get along with easy going you know people pleaser I can blend into any crowd I can you know make anybody feel comfortable or trust me or you know whatever but I don't ever share much about myself mm -hmm. um and, um, so where am I going with this? I really, I've, I, my partner reflected something to me recently when we had something come up that is kind of fueling this question. She said to me, it's really hard when I'm having something that comes up for me, uh, for her, um, that you then, you know, make it about your process, you make it about you. And, um, and I do, I recognize that, like, I'll, I'll like acknowledge some what's going on for her. And then I say, you know, I go into like, yeah, and this is like, this is a place where I'm weak, and I'm working on this, and I'm trying to do this so that this doesn't happen again, and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, she, she said something like, you know, it's really hard when, when I've got things up that you then say, I, this, I, 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 and I'm like, oh my God, ego, I, me, me, me. And, um, I guess I'm really just trying to be able to be more present for her and like, okay, so here's something when, when that sort of stuff comes up, I, I feel like I, I get in a good flow with meditation, with inquiry, with being in the senses, and then um, a conflict comes up and I like fall back. I like fall into all of my distractions, all of my ways of numbing out and like feeling like I've got some control and I can go, you know, play video games or eat food or like make myself feel better. And, and then it feels like my inquiry isn't relevant at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I like lose lose touch with my meditation practice. I lose touch with all of that. And it, I like get so wrapped up in this, this place. And, and it, it feel, and it's always when it's something that's focused on me, when she's upset with me, like if she's upset with somebody else, I can be there. I can listen. I can, you know, go through it all with her and reflect and like be there for her. But as soon as it's something about me, I, I'm all in defense. And so I've started to have 
like an inquiry hit me the other day that I've just started to do that maybe is, maybe you're just going to tell me, just do that. Um, I've had the question going in my head when there's stuff up between us of like, what if there was nothing to defend? Like, what if there was nothing to defend? And, and in some like intellectual place, I know that like this stealth that I get so worked up about that feels like it's getting attacked is, and like, yeah, this persona that I have of being the easy one and being the one who can, you know, whatever, like get along with anybody. Uh, when it feels like that's not happening, that's when it gets all messy. So, yeah, I don't even necessarily know what my question is exactly here. Just I'm really looking for a way to be able to, I guess, be in that better um, when these situations come up so that I can be more there for her and also feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I don't like lose touch with practice, I suppose of, yeah, like it, it, I feel like I like completely fall out of, uh, I don't know, like consciousness or like, uh, like I go into all these unconscious places. Sure. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, okay. that's kind of my question. Yeah. Thanks for hearing me. Sure. A, a couple of things as you were speaking, hit me to, to mention on different levels. Um, and some of it's kind of directly to you, but some of it's really for anyone listening because the, the overarching issue of validation seeking approval seeking, as you mentioned that clip, which is really, really, really good scene, um, is so much more deeply ingrained in people's psyches than they realize it, it, going through this process reveals everything. And it's surprising how deep it goes, how deep just validation seeking goes, whether it's, whether it's in with casual acquaintances or whether it's with people we're emotionally connected to. And there's completely different sets of rules for those two spaces in the human psyche, I find. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's just different. So some people function way better in one than the other. Some people don't function well in either one and so forth. So so just know that like you might feel confident and and have really good social skills in, in say a casual situation or at work and you may not at home at all and or mm -hmm. vice versa, actually. Yeah, and so it can happen the other way around as well. Um, and the 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 triggers around validation seeking and approval seeking and, and all that um, are varied and they're deeply rooted in our psyche and they um, are conditions based. So things can be dormant for a long time until you're in the right set of circumstances. Like for instance, if you're single, then you may not have these triggers hit you really until you're in a relationship. And then all of a sudden then the triggers hit mm -hmm. vice versa. You may not realize how much loneliness you carry until you're actually not in a rom romantically connected relationship for a while. And then you're like, wow, there's so much loneliness here, you know? So conditions trigger these various uh, experiences as well. And um, so, so the reason I say that is just so people understand that you, you can often feel defeated or like, you know, like I'm backsliding or whatever, but really you're just being exposed to new sets of conditions or deeper intimacy with your partner and things like that, that allow you to come into contact with these, these challenges or these vasanas or these sticking points or whatever it is. Um, so that's an, that's an overarching statement, but it's to not be aware of how strongly validation uh, and uh, approval seeking affects us would be to be completely unconscious to it. It's 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 like running you like a puppet unless you're aware of it. Even when you're aware of it, it still has a very strong influence and pull and it can take a long time to unwind it. So the fact that you're very aware of it and interested in working with it and all that stuff is very good. Um, specific to people pleasing, um, that's a, so so if you have that tendency, I, I would say like, I definitely have had it in the past in certain areas more than others in some areas, not really but I know the movement of it for sure. And I understand it. And I've been in that environment and I know what the triggers are and so forth. Um, but one thing I, I would like to tell people who feel that because a lot of sort of spiritual people or people on this path are very sensitive people. They're sensitive and compassionate. And th that's a setup for people pleasing, especially if you've grown up in an environment with a parent who can't manage their own nervous system, you learn to regulate mm -hmm. it for them, even as a child, before you've even developed an identity, fully developed an identity yourself. And so it gets really baked into your behaviors, patterns, and so forth. Okay. So, um, so first of all, just give yourself, you know, some, mm -hmm. some space and, and realize like, I, it's, it really comes out of compassion at some level. You, you care about that person at some level, right. You, you know, or you wouldn't even care if you had no 
awareness of their state at all and really did not give a shit how they were feeling, you wouldn't be people, people pleasing. You'd be a sociopath, but you wouldn't be people pleasing, right? <laughs> so the fact that you empathize strongly that an empathy has is a two-way street. If you if someone feels angry, if someone feels sad, if someone feels scared, you, you're not going to get to some spiritual place where you just don't feel that anymore. You will get to the place where you have such a capacity for it that nothing's resisting it anymore. So you can experience it with them empathically and compassionately without having to react to it or add something or subtract something. Um, but it's also important to realize that we are mammals. We have empathic wiring and we're always going to feel reactions around, not necessarily reactions, but we're going to feel empathic experiences around people all the time. It's just going to happen. And, and accepting that is important as well, because we can have this ideal that, oh, I shouldn't react to anything. I shouldn't have any response. I shouldn't feel that's not true. Um, then the last thing I really want to tell you is something simple. And it's just as, as new experiences or even old experiences that resurface, that feel intense, emotionally intense, where you really want to do something you want to do. Like, that's how I felt when you were describing the situations. Like, you know, your partner's telling you something and you want to do something. So you're either saying, here's what I'm working on, or here's this, or here's that. Or instead of just saying, Hey, can I, do I have the capacity to just feel what's going on with this person right now and just not react too much uh, or not react at all, or not offer anything specific other than space, listening, feeling, um, and just letting them say what needs to be said. Uh, um, it's really just a matter of, as Suzanne said in a previous question, it's you're really training your nervous system that it has the capacity. If it knows it has the capacity, it doesn't react. It doesn't have to react. It may have to set boundaries sometimes. And so understand there's differences there too. Like if somebody's being abusive towards you and so forth, you have every right to set a boundary or say something's unkind or whatever, if, it, if it's really, you know, needs to be said and so forth, this gets into gray areas, of course, but generally speaking, if somebody's not attacking you or, you know, physically threatening you in some way or whatever, you, you often just have the capacity to just feel the intensity of what they're feeling, even if it's anger, even if it's deep grief, even if it's frustration, all those things and, and feel it with them. And that's it, you know? Um, and it can be a matter of just putting your attention in your own body and just going, wow, okay. The intensity level in here is high, but do I actually have to react to anything right now? Is there anything that's making me react? Is there anything that's causing there to be a reaction out of necessity and really looking for it, you know, is there at all? And, and staying with that and, you know, keeping some attention on the environment as well of whatever seems to be triggering you. And I think what happens over time is that that gap does open up the, the reaction gap, the gap between what seems to be occurring and, and how you seem to have to react to it. And as the gap opens up, you often find that these things aren't as causally related as they seem. It may really seem like, no, it's definitely about that person, right? My, whatever it is, it's definitely about that person and what they're saying and who they are and who they, who I know they are. But the more this gap opens, the more you realize it's really not actually, it's about my own response to my own internal experience. And my, and part of my internal experience is an interpretation of what's happening externally. Yeah. And that, and those get stuck together like this. You really forget that, okay, I'm, I'm actually reacting to a set of preconditioned responses that started with my mother. Then it was with my, whatever, whoever, however that happens. And then we just apply it to various situations when certain emotional triggers come. And that's mm -hmm. another, that's, that's why it's important to understand the empathic piece that you can't not have the empathic experience, but that empathic experience is not causally related to you having to react to anything or even make any conclusion, actually. Uh, that's, that's what it means mm -hmm. to know that capacity you have, and it will deepen and deepen and deepen over time. And um, you can also just look at these moments as, as opportunities to be like, okay, how can I how can I really learn to just open that gap up? And if I have a response, you know, think about it, sit with it for a while and come back when you're calm and, you know, respond or whatever. Um, but you have the capacity for sure. It's, it's there. The only thing that gets in the way is habits and, and habits are unfortunately a lot largely unconscious when it comes to emotional connections, mm -hmm. because they started again before we were fully conscious ourselves before we had fully formed an identity, we were already being shaped that way. So they happen very quickly and very deeply. Um, but you can definitely learn that you don't have to react in, in, in habituated ways. That's about mm. it. That's about all I got. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I, I, think, uh, yeah, just hearing that I'm sure for other people, it's different things, but it's, 
particularly it's specific around anger and anger directed at me. And yeah, I grew up with a, an angry father. So I think that yeah. that all just got tied in and um, yeah. So thanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to sure. look for that gap. And also look into resentment just when you're on your own about that, because anger is a very intense emotion and we can, we can build resentment around just anger being directed at us when we know we yeah. didn't deserve it. We didn't do anything to deserve it yet. You know, that angry mm-hmm. energy is coming towards us and it has an effect on us. And when it's a cumulative effect over years, there's some resentment that builds up around it. Like, you know, I don't deserve uh, this kind of thing. So just knowing that those are also in there, those motivations. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Then I get angry mm-hmm. with that resentment. Sure. Well, that's the problem yeah. with people pleasing. We could talk a long time about people pleasing, but what happens is you're, you're suppressing your own anger and your own boundaries. And that's not a good thing to do. It's not a good thing to suppress your own boundaries, right? And then then it will come out and it'll come out like too much, too fast and and not clear. Yeah, nailed it. Exactly, yes. Cool. All right. Thanks. Nice meeting you. Yeah, th- thanks for the questions. Suzanne may have a, a response as well. Um, yeah, that was beautiful. I'm, I'm a people pleaser too. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to add to kind of look at it as really innocent that you didn't create that and it's such an understandable thing that would be there um like of course as kids we want approval you know that's how we get love and acceptance and feel safe and it's such an innocent mechanism that's happening so it's not your fault it's not something you should look at as wrong, as bad as I need to change this and fix this. And if only this was gone, it'd be better. It's just that we're all, you know, uniquely, beautifully flawed in all of these different ways. And we just have to learn to work with it and use the relationship as your growth and awakening or whatever you want to call it like it's the perfect place to do so and yeah I would I would say I feel like I'm just adding on to what Angela said because he said it you know but I guess I just want to reiterate like when your your partner wants space purely for her allow that space for her and then you get your time too. Like, like Angelo said, you could process it on your own, process the anger a little bit, and then have your own time too. So both of you have the space, you know, equally. Uh, it's, it's important for both of you guys to fully be heard and seen. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, she said that to me a couple of times now of like, it's, it's your timing. Your timing is just not good. Um, when I bring up my stuff and I think, um, yeah, that's, that's something I'm learning. Yeah. And I, I really do think seeing the innocence of all of these conditionings and mechanisms and patterns and, and when we notice them, of course, there's going to be this reaction to it because even that's patterning as well, how we relate to ourselves because we think that that's us, you know? And yeah. just to notice that dynamic and yeah, I just, I think I just want to emphasize the innocence of it because what's seen mm-hmm. deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper layers is that yeah, holy shit, we're, we're just trying to feel safe and be seen and be appreciated. And like, what's wrong with that, really? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <sighs> and so Thank then you, you. Don't have to, you don't have to be that defensive about it because everyone pretty much has it. Not everyone, everyone, but like the mass majority of people. So it's, it's okay. Thank you. Yeah. That was a Thank beautiful you. question. Thank you for your question and answer as well. Yeah.
Okay, where are we at here? Um, uh, Alec. Me again? Nope. Is there another Alec? All right. Yeah, okay, let's start over. Just kidding. Uh, Mike B. Hey, hey, can hey, you Mike. hear me? I can. So I just made myself lunch and started eating, but I'll put that aside. All right. So I don't really, I was sort of anticipating this call and, um, you know, questions had come up and, and they all seem kind of pointless in a way. Um, so I'm just really going to say hi and uh, acknowledge this weird situation where, you know, your voice is a trusted voice. I listen to you regularly and it's just this kind of weird situation. Never met you, but I'm looking forward to the retreat. And um, I guess I am interested, I, I would say that I am still looking for that um, awakening, which I know that the seeking is definitely a, a barrier to that. But um, I'm just in a place where there's, you know, this low-lying depression and lack of motivation, and it's like the the normal distractions don't hold the same um, ability to distract and the same appeal as they used to, but it's not like I just feel driven to sit and meditate for hours. It's just kind of like this low lying blah and just being sick of me and the way that I show up in the world. And so I'm kind of interested in hearing a bit about, depression and any thoughts on like procrastination and lack of motivation and um yeah that's my spiel okay thank you suzanne do you have anything to start or shall i um you can go okay you know what struck me when uh, i was listening to you is uh this this sort of like spiritual desert sort of thing this that happens um, there are times when we have this intense spiritual drive or yearning or inquiry, or, uh, it's just at the center of our attention, uh, whatever it is, this, this identity issue and it feels like the energy is endless to, to kind of keep digging and discerning and questioning and all, um, and underlying it, there's a, there's a sort of attunement to some sort of truth. Uh, there are other times when uh, probably through some of that questioning and inquiry and uh, um, digging in to our own internal experience, the the older motivations fall away, the more self-centered perhaps motivations, or maybe the more cognitive or mental or conceptual motivations fall away. And it's like, well, well who am I then? Like, who, who am I to even want anything, you know? And um mm. spiritual and it just it feels kind of like blah kind of yeah. uh yeah does that does that resonate yeah yeah okay yeah what i what i suggest is just patience that what yeah. i what i because what i find happens is it's a, it's a, just a sort of a phase like like so many things it's just an experience that will pass and often when that experience passes um uh maybe a little bit more of a clearer or deeper attunement starts to drive the bus maybe in a different way um unless it really starts to feel like there's an urgency to this like like i'm really overlooking something here i re there's really something below the conscious level that's wanting my attention but i can feel myself completely avoiding it if it's something like that it may be helpful to do some inquiry around it like what am i hiding from myself here you know, what mm -hmm. am I really afraid of that kind of thing? But that may not be what it is. It may really just be this sort of spiritual desert where it's kind of like a doldrum, you know, it, the, there's nothing moving anything. And in one sense, you could say that's a good sign. It shows some, some clarity because 
really there's nothing you need to do. There's nothing, there's no one there that needs to do it and you're not going to get somewhere. So that all can land in a certain way. Uh, and some of those, like I said, those agendas can kind of fall away, but it also is like, well, what's driving the bus now? Am I, am I done with this whole thing is, you know, um, I can still feel some self, you know, experience around, I still see the world is divided, you know, or whatever. Something tells me this is not completed. And yet I don't really don't feel any motivation that's authentic right now. I would say stay with your authenticity and it's okay. Just just see what happens and and things always change as they always do. So that's my instinct. Thank you. You're welcome. Should I add something? Totally up to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I was going to say that the flavor of depression and despair could be very familiar um, when you're going through this because your your kind of personal will is being diminished. So your motivation and ambition to really do in the same way might be diminishing. Mm. And yeah, I think, I think to Angelo's point of like, if it does feel really genuine that there is no real authentic motivation to, to like do right now. Um, yeah, I would say it's not really a bad, bad thing. <laughs> just slightly bad not bad bad <laughs> i mean you know it's it's worrisome sometimes because if it if it drags on for like way too long of course the mind is going to worry a bit and uh question but i mean just to describe what happened here is like there was what appeared to be like deep depression and deep despair and but there was honestly no energy to really do anything and um i just i just felt it was really different than before um yeah meaning meaning before i felt like the mind could really conjure up importance in something and then there would be energy to do it but more and more I felt like the mind was kind of worrying but there literally wasn't the energy to do anything um it just had a, a different flavor um yeah thank you sure Thanks, Mike. All right, moving on to Philip. Hey, sorry about that. My screen uh, went black. No worries. Uh, I just have like a simple question. I uh, appreciate everybody else's shares. They were wonderful. Um, I guess, how do you know where you are along the path of what, what you've laid out in your book and in your talks? Well, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm usually disinclined from even telling people anything about that. Aside from that, you know, to be honest, like the, the way I might work with somebody approaching a, an initial awakening when it's close, when it feels like it's really coming to a head. There may be certain ways I might point that are that are different than than afterward that can be unnecessary or counterproductive, perhaps. But even even with that said, everyone's so different. And most of the time, when I'm interacting with people, whether they've had that initial shift, whether they've not, uh, whether whether they've gone beyond that, and they've even had deeper experiences, non-dual, and so forth, um, still, I don't think of them in those terms. I don't I don't think of you in terms of awake or asleep because I don't think you of in, you in terms of a you, it's just, it's just this experience flowing. So my interaction with somebody comes out of this experience and 
the quality of what we speak about or what we interact with, it really just has to do with what, what's going on with you right now. And this is one thing I tell people when I first meet them, if they want to work with me or something like that, I always kind of say, you know, I don't really care where, what happened to you before too much. I mean, we can talk about it if it feels relevant, but I don't want them to worry about that too much. They don't have to make sure they tell me the story right because I don't care about the story. I'm, I care about what's going on with you now. What do you feel? What are your emotional experiences? What are your perceptions? And if you're doing some sort of inquiry practice, like what is your what is your insight showing you right now? How is that working for you? Um, and so that's generally how, how I um, work with people. Uh, when it comes to, sometimes if you're working, like say you're working through the Fetter model in a very specific, precise way, there are very specific distinctions um, that uh, that that are clarified with with certain experiential insights, specifically like non dual realization. It, it's usually pretty obvious when suddenly there's just no sense of boundary anymore at all, and it doesn't doesn't come and go. That's you know that can happen with the, the self dropping away completely, but it do, it often doesn't. It often happens before that. And so sometimes those insights are, I work around those with somebody if that's what they're working on in this moment. But even then, you know, somebody in that, in that space is probably not worried about like where I am it because the sense of self has diminished so much. It's just more like, what is my experience right now? What is, what is the nature of experience? And we can work through that. I guess I was asking because in some sense, one, I don't have a reference, but even today I was sort of driving and I wasn't having any thought that was fully in my body and it was a sense of peace calm and my heart was feeling like it was loving which was unusual actually for me because i'm really in my head i can be and i've sort of like now really caught or at least i'm able to observe it right quite well oh oh, oh I've been stuck there, I've been caught there and then as I was driving, I didn't want to be anywhere. I didn't have to be somewhere. I was like, what? The? I didn't really even question it, actually. But later, you know, I'm like, what? Like, you know, I even come in on this. I don't even do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really weird. Yeah, those are, those are really nice moments, right? Because, like, something's tapping you on the shoulder saying, hey, have you looked at this? Right? And not- notice this depth of experience that's available because it's always here. Um, without that, I'm not sure we would really wake up because, you know, because sometimes the dream can even be kind of comfortable in certain ways. It is, it is comfortable in its familiarity, but when it becomes, when it starts to become uncomfortable, that's a motivation to, to start to dig in. Or when you have something like that, where it's like, well, okay, that I can't deny the fact that there was a clarity that is very unusual in my experience. I can't deny the fact there was an interconnectedness or a heart-based experience of love or unity uh, that's uncaused uh, that's not usually in my experience so those those little promptings uh, by life uh, um, are, are in my experience are just really nice moments of grace that say hey <laughs> you know yeah, yeah I get shadowed by doubt but then also the, the mind will question uh, do you want to go deeper because this going to get emotional this is going to get the repressed stuff going to come up and i don't know if i can handle that yeah you know what i mean yes here's the thing here's the thing you 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 can handle it that's the beauty of this you have the capacity for it i know you do but but with that said your mind will tell you at times i can't handle this (laughs) your mind will think it can't handle this but that's why that's why this initial discernment is really important and helpful. And why I point to this first awakening often, because that really opens up this massive gap and where you, you finally realize, okay, no thought is ultimately true. No thought defines me. No thought defines reality. They're thoughts. And so you have a lot of space to work when you realize, okay, there are going to be intense moments with emotions coming to the surface that you just don't want to feel. And your mind's going, you're going to go crazy. You're going to become insane. You're going to be psychotic. You won't be able to go to work. You won't be able to take care of your family. You're, you know, it'll it'll just use whatever it can do to try to get traction but once you've opened up enough space you just it becomes more and more um frivolous well, i think i've had that without observing thought so that's why i was like well if this is how much more will yeah you know what I mean? yeah well that's the beauty of this is like 
in this moment, in this, in this, this, whatever this is, there's no more or less. More and less are of the mind. There's no, there's no, there's no, in one sense, there's no need for capacity because there's infinite capacity because there's not, there's no container. So, so there, the, that's what I mean by your capacity is tremendous, but, um, but disidentifying from thoughts more and more and more, everything will take care of itself. That's in one sense, that's kind of your job. Your job is just to, to see when you feel like you're getting yourself caught in a, in a thought, a belief or an identity all innocently, by the way, we never chose which beliefs to adopt. We, we were empathically impressed and, and through emotional experiences, they were impressed upon us and buried in our unconscious actually. And then when they start to manifest and play out, and then we can see the thought forms, we might be like, wow, I'm a bad person or something. No, they're just habituated patterns that we adopted totally unconsciously. So it's actually all in, innocent and quite an impersonal process. Um, but the more we're able to disidentify from thoughts and realize a thought as a thought, not, not to become a watcher, not to push thoughts away, but just to realize it's simply a thought, you know, a thought right now that says, God, I must be a terrible person is no more real or less real than a thought that says, gosh, I'm the best person in the world. They're thoughts. They're just movements in consciousness and they ultimately have no real truth to them. Yeah. I was getting that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's a fun exploration. <laughs> Well, I, I get the anxiety, right? That, that, that anxiety and that weight. And then sometimes I get really heavy in the head. I'm really heavy. It draws me right down. It's yeah. Like, Whoa. It's a... Well, that's a good sign because, you know, when, as people disidentify from thought, from, con from, from concepts and all that sort of thing, it really does just release a lot of energy in the head. It releases a massive amount of energy from, from that space. And it, it feels like pressure. It feels like headaches at different times. Over time, you'll find modalities, you know, there's, there's the ways to work with that, but, but also you, you will, you'll, your body will just get better at energy management. It will do it far more naturally and spontaneously. Okay. Cause one time I was uh, just quickly, I was doing that sound meditation you got there, seeing the sounds and then my whole body was like, felt like energy, whole thing, energy. And mm -hmm. then it was overwhelming and my heart went, bam, and I was like, that's enough. And yeah. I got out. Yeah. Is that normal? Yeah, that's, that's, again, that's that strange response where we feel this intense, full-on energetic experience where it's like you, you and the energy aren't too. Uh, and and then the mind will just whisper in your ear, like, this is too much. I can't handle it. It's over, you know, and it's fine that you listen to it. It's going to happen on occasion. And sometimes it is overwhelming or whatever, but over time you'll realize, oh, that's just a thought. And then the body will just, you know, you'll just continue to feel it and like, oh, okay, well, really there are no boundaries to this. You know, only, only a thought can tell me how much I can handle or not handle. And what if I just don't listen to that? And it's just like, whoom, whoom, whoom. It can be quite something, the energetics of this. Uh, okay. So, so if I can be with it, be with it. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just be alert to thoughts. Oh, a thought just said that this is going to kill me. Well, right. why? You know, I mean, this, that's a thought. Here. Yeah. Exactly. Thought. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool, yeah. cool man. Yeah. Nice hearing from you. Suzanne may have some other things as well. No, I thought that was beautiful. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Okay. That was, that wasn't Jeff, I don't think. Jeff, you're up. <laughs> Great. Good. Hi, okay. Angela. Hi, Suzanne. Hello. Um, I Hi. feel like I'm coming, I feel like I'm coming full circle on my Angelo experience here. So, uh, um, uh, I've been meditating for about five years, been into non-duality for about two. I sat my first uh, retreat with you, the silent retreat that you did about a year and a half ago. Um, and so that was pretty new into my non-duality going down the rabbit hole. And uh, and I got really into it. I have a huge seeking energy at the time. At the time of that retreat, I had huge seeking energy. So a lot of that has really calmed down. Um, and what I asked at that retreat was about my monkey mind, which just never stops. <laughs> And so, you know, for fast forward a year and a half to now, I feel like I've made so much progress that, um, you know, I mean, I, I see my thoughts clearly. Uh, I understand that that they are not me. I, I look into the nature of my thoughts and see that they arise spontaneously and that, that no one creates them and no one actually even listens to them. The hearing of the thought is built into the thought itself. You know, all of that, super clear to me. Um, and so... Even though I've come so far, uh, the freaking monkey mind just never shuts up. It, it drives me nuts. <laughs> um, and so, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I have a, 
I kind of have a predisposition to, to be mind identified. Uh, you know, I've been an engineer my entire life. I go to my head to figure things out. Um, I've had a you know, childhood experiences with a critical mother and emotionally absent. So I have a very um, strong shame response. And so that's actually uh, contributed to me uh, collecting as much information as I can because it helps me to avoid situations that might be embarrassing. And so, you know, I've become an expert on everything. Uh, um, and so for me to, to drop out of my mind, um, is just really difficult to do, even though I can see clearly that these thoughts are just arising. Hmm. And so what happens now is when I catch myself thinking, which is all the time, um, you know, I, I either try to get embodied. Um, so I'll just tune into my sense fields and, you know, usually the, the thought will, will, thoughts will dissipate to a degree, but of course, as soon as I stop that, they rush right back in. Um, and so sometimes I will, uh, I'll look at the nature of the thought, you know, try to make sure I see that it's independently arising and, you know, just, it just happens. Um, sometimes I'll just try to watch the thought, you know, let the thoughts continue, but just try to create some separation between the thoughts and whatever I am. Mm -hmm. Um, and they all help to a degree for that moment, but then the thoughts just come back. And so like, I'm just constantly dealing with, I'm not getting caught in them so much anymore, but I'm just constantly dealing with the fact that my mind just never stops. And so one of my questions was, um, is there any, do you think that there might be any benefit in my formal practice to maybe focus more on, um, on like a shamatha type practice to cultivate some samadhi? Uh, Cause right now I'm primarily doing uh, natural meditation. Um, and so what I find, even, even when I try to do a samadhi practice, it's like I oftentimes have to use some kind of noting in my mind just to keep it busy. <laughs> so whether this just in, out, or, you know, whatever, if I try to do nothing and just tune into my breath, then there's always some chatter going on up here. And I see it, that's chatter, and, you know, but it just never goes away. <laughs> and so if I really want to quiet the mind, I, I have to occupy the mind with something mm -hmm. else i'm finding so i don't know if it would be a good idea to to pour more shama to practice in, into my formal meditation and also in the moment when i'm noticing myself thinking um you know is there one approach that might be more beneficial than another to try to get me out of my mind mm -hmm. um so you know whether that's just watching the thoughts and letting them float by or whether it's you know getting embodied or or, you know, just try to figure out anything to, to make the monkey calm down. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So, so a couple of things I'm inclined to say, one is, um, that what you just mentioned, should I, should I become the watcher of the thoughts or should I become embodied? It's actually something right in the middle of that. It's, it's in between those two, those two extremes. Um, the other thing I'm inclined to say, or ask you a question is when, when that monkey mind is going crazy, who's not disturbed by it? It's like a koan. Who's not disturbed at all by that? The monkey. The monkey doesn't care. Yeah. Okay. So the thoughts are the, the vines that the monkey's grabbing onto or whatever. In this analogy, the monkey is like, is actually not the thoughts. It's your reaction to the thoughts. So the resistance that I'm creating That's is contributing it. to the process. Well, I don't even know if you're creating the resistance, but it's just there, right? So yeah. there's some underlying belief that it shouldn't be this way. That's the whole question you're asking, right? Behind all of this question, there's something that just says, there's a belief that says it shouldn't be this way, right? So part of this, I would say, is accepting like the mind can make all the thoughts at once. I don't really don't give a shit. Like I genuinely don't care. I, I Angelo, I don't care how many thoughts this mind makes. And strangely, having that digested at such a deep level, it doesn't make many thoughts anymore. It, it can, but it's, it can be very quiet. So, um, uh, that's one thing. The other thing I would tell you is there is a sort of practice for this. I, I, what I, the way I describe it or call it is meditation in pure, in unbound consciousness, unbound consciousness, meaning the simple way of just is, is just instead of going, okay, what am I going to do in this meditation about thoughts? How am I going to calm the mind? Blah, blah, blah. Don't say any of that. Just go bring on the thoughts. I want to see the next thought. Like, as closely as possible right now, move your attention directly into the thought just when it comes. So it's not becoming a watcher of thoughts. You're not standing back from thoughts. That's step one in disidentifying from thoughts. Step two is the feminine aspect. You have to become completely merged with it. 
Because once you see that's not a thought, then you don't have to have a reaction. I'm sorry. Once you see that a thought is not reality, you don't have to have a reaction to it. There's still some belief left that thoughts have some pull to them. It's more of a it's more of a, a visceral experience in in the thought space. The other thing I wanted to say is you you seem clear in the sense fields. This is also a sense field. In in Buddhism, they describe it very clearly. There's the five senses, and the sixth sense is consciousness or thought, essentially, right? Mind. So there is a way to meditate in thought. There's a, med a way to meditate in consciousness where it's as if instead of take. So so let me put it this way: to think a thought, to be engaged in a thought, especially identified with the thought, such that you don't even know it's a thought, you have to have a distance from it. That's kind of how it works. There's you're without noticing it, we're holding back pushing and pulling on this thought, then this thought pops. We push and pull on this, then this one pops up and they lead one to another. When we were kids, sometimes we were aware of it because it was like a new thing we noticed in our mind. But as we come, become adults, those thoughts are like super coiled and they're just going constantly. And so we're always holding just a little bit of distance. You can actually reverse that by just orienting to the next thought. And as it arises, it's like you merge right into it. It's, it's like you want to get as close as you possibly can to that conscious substance of thought, whatever it is. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a movement rather than a stillness. Um, that's the practice I describe. And, and I, I usually describe it over and over to people and then suddenly they get it and they're like, oh my God, I totally got it. And once they do <laughs> thoughts are never a problem again at all, because you can always meditate in this way. And it's actually quite enjoyable. So it's moving directly toward every thought that's arising, expand. It's like dilate your, your awareness in the thought space, in the thought gate, dilate your awareness in every direction. And it's like, just, just completely open, alert, and relaxed to the next arising thought. And what will happen is like, as your attention just moves into it and it stops often or stops arising, it doesn't have to, but it often does. And then it's like, okay, we'll be alert to the next thought and the next thought and the next thought. And then instead of that standing wave of mind identification and thought identification, it closes and it's not a wave anymore. It's like, it's just that pure merged conscious experience. Some people call it PCE or pure conscious, pure consciousness experience. It's it's a skill you can actually learn. It's a way of meditating. And it's quite effortless once you do it. it. It feels quite not like a practice. It almost feels like everything else is a practice. Like everything else is an effort to, to make thoughts and believe thoughts and react to thoughts. This is quite the opposite. So that's one thing to, to play with is instead of becoming a watcher of thoughts, become a curious about the nature of the substance of thought itself. What is that space in which they even a, a seem to appear? It's gotcha. weird, so, right? so, yeah. So, so when you say you move, when you say you move into it, obviously you don't want to move into the content of the thought, but well, you just want to move the into the, the nature of the thought itself, right? Yeah, what, like, what's it made out of? The analogy I yeah. often use is like if there's a movie on a screen and you're sitting in a theater and you've been watching the movie for a long time, such that you actually believe those are real characters, those are real shapes, those are real lines that divide the person, divide the person from the background. Like that just seems real to you because those are all symbolic your brain understands the symbology, but it doesn't mean that's what's actually happening on the screen. It's not at all, right? That's not what's happening on the screen. The closer you get to the screen, the more obvious that becomes. So as you walk closer to the screen going, well, what is this substance? What is it? And then it just looks like colors flashing and moving. You can't, yeah. you're too far away to pick up the symbology. Then as you get even closer, you realize even the colors are all kind of the same color. They're kind of like light. Then you can turn around, and look directly into the projector. That's what I'm talking about. It's like, pure consciousness experience, pure knowingness or knowingness to put it in like a Dzogchen phraseology would be Rigpa consciousness, um, uh, consciousness Rigpa, um, or just unbound consciousness. Unbound, I mean, unbound from the experience of a subject object in consciousness, where you feel like a, a, a conscious one experiencing a thought as an object. You can collapse that, through, ex but you just have to be completely oriented toward thoughts instead of away from thoughts. They won't become, gotcha. they won't become a, they won't become a, an identified experience if you really move toward ongoing moment to moment to moment experientially, right? In that space of the, whatever it feels like to you, a mist of consciousness or whatever. Gotcha. Try, gotcha. try that and out. Let me know how it goes. I do notice that some of the thoughts that the, the, the nature of the content of the thought, uh, even though I see it as a thought, um, there's a pull to it. Uh, a lot of my thoughts are kind of rehearsal thoughts. And so, you know, and, and a lot of my rehearsal thoughts are, um, well, there's some people pleasing in there. There's some perfectionists in there. I'm, I'm trying to like, like solidify how I feel about a, a particular topic maybe. And so I go over in my mind over and over and over again. 
Um, and there's a, there's a, even, and when it rises up and I notice it, there's, there's a, there's like an addictive pull to it. It's like, Ooh, I want to, I want to actually dig into that thought, yeah. not the nature of the thought, the actual content of the thought. And so I'll notice that sometimes I will, sometimes I'll push myself away. And I, you yeah. know, so that's the only other aspect of it that gets a little bit complicated is most well, of the time I can just, I can see the thoughts rise up, but some of them have a real addictive quality to them. Yeah, I understand. So right now, what's the thought? Right if now, you, if if you were practicing this right now, what would the thought be? Everything you just said. All that stuff is made out of something. Now yeah. look. At, now look right at it. Where is it? Where is it? Right. Oh, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Look, look for it. Put your attention to it. Toward it. Wherever it is. Where does your attention go? Kind of puts you silent, doesn't it? Yeah, it gets just blank. That's yeah. Keep going. That's what I want you to do. Now be alert for the next thought. Oh. Okay. That's how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. That thought can be any kind of doesn't matter what it is. It's going to be a narrative thought about, oh, well, this is how it usually goes for me. Whatever. It's just a thought in this moment. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. That's it. it. And you just stay with that. You stay with that. It's really enjoyable. Cool. Very cool. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Suzanne, anything? Um, let me see. Well, so there's no one there that has ever produced a thought. So the thoughts are just coming up. We don't know what thoughts are. They're pure energy. And they're free to come and go whenever, because it's always been that way. You've never been in control of that. It's not your responsibility to silence them or do anything with them really. And sometimes there's just more attention here, but equally so what's going on in, in the body, there's body's just a word, but there's equal energy everywhere. So just notice if there's too much attention here and it's a little imbalance, what's happening here? And you have no control in any of the energies or sensations that are arising here. But they're just free to come and go. Yeah, yeah. I, I have noticed before, uh, or at least, again, more thought, but um, I've noticed how much energy I actually expend in my thinking process. I mean, it just amazes me sometimes when I look at just how active my mind is and I realize how much energy that's consuming. I also catch myself many times, even when I'm relaxing, um, you know, fidgeting, fingers are moving, feet are tapping. I mean, there's just so much pent up energy in me a lot of the time mm -hmm. um, that, uh, and, you know, I've just really started to become more aware of it, you know, in the past yeah. year or so. But yeah, That's it's beautiful. It's there. Yeah. When you get more, um, this is just a, a word, but when you become more aware of it or more attention is put to it, then it's like, wow, there's like a lot of just movement or antsiness or agitation or, you know, and it's a beautiful yeah. thing. It's that's how it is. You just notice that, wow, there's just a lot of energy in here. So it's going to feel potentially more uncomfortable, but you'll get used to it. And it's, um, yeah, it's very normal. Oh. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you very much. much. Okay. Well, we're at uh, two hours. That went by so fast. So Ooh. much fun. Yeah. Suzanne, thank you so much. It was yeah. been, been so good. Thank you too, Angelo. That was great. And everyone who, who shared and is here. Do you want to say how people can find you in case they want to get a hold of you or book something? Uh, yeah. On YouTube, Suzanne Non-Duality. Um, yeah. Website, Suzanne Chang. Yeah. Suzanne Chang, one word. Dot net. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, dot yeah. net. Suzanne Chang, one word, dot net. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you so much again. And everyone, thank you so much for your questions, your honesty, your vulnerability, and just willingness to come and mix it up with us. It's been a blast. Yeah, really wonderful. See y'all. <laughs>